Well, lovely to have you all with us. If you could get this web page uh, uh, ready, because you're going to need some resources from it during the seminar. Yeah, if you could have that 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 ready, because we will need that at certain points uh, throughout the seminar. Okay. In the chat pane, everyone, why have you come tonight? Okay, seems it'd be helpful for life. Absolutely, Margaret, great. Curious to know more. Thanks, Charles. Uh, Sharon, learn more about one's heart. Great. Heart is the key to everything we do and say. Absolutely. Necessity to be to stay united. Great. I know that I need to examine my own heart uh, and be truthful about what I need to work on. Fantastic, Rebecca. Thank you. Desire to understand motivations of my heart. Great. Uh, Rebecca, I think so often we can blame others, but the problem is normally our hearts very interesting. Fair play. Because God wants our hearts. Our men, Katie. Curious, Pat. Thank you. Um, because this is a key issue that we need to keep considering all flows from the heart. Thank you, Sharon. Maria, very rare to learn about our hearts, so it's interesting. Good. To be equipped with tools to seek the heart beneath everything else that's going on. Good. I've coincidentally reading the book of Gemma over the last week the last few weeks and chapter 17 talks about the heart we're going to look at chapter 17 of jeremiah and moses god bless you helpful for life groups and to grow an understanding of our own hearts uh, a bit new so trying to learn more Maeve, you're so welcome delighted you're here well done for coming and thank you uh, hopefully this will be helpful to you um okay <coughs> so um let me give a bit of teaching and then you're back in breakout rooms to discuss that's going to be the format of tonight and then we might do a bit of modeling it so why is the heart so important? I think someone even semi-quoted this in the answers. Above all else, guard your heart for everything flows from it. So we are told to guard our hearts because everything flows from it, not just emotions. We'll see that in a moment. So that's the first reason. Guard your hearts because everything flows from it. Okay. The, uh, the second thing, Jeremiah 17, my good friend Moses just introduced us to this. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? In other words, we shouldn't give ourselves too much credit or think that we are, you know, quite good people. It sort of said, no, this, the heart has a power to deceive you. And you must understand that. And in one sense, it's beyond cure of humans. Like we can't cure it ourselves. And who can understand it? So Jeremiah is saying there's a real challenge because our hearts are deceitful and incurable and hard to understand. So that's why it's important. Everything flows from it because our hearts are complicated. Every one of us has a complicated heart. Uh, none of us are these nice, pure, innocent children that have just got nothing going on there. We've got a lot going on in our hearts. And even from the age of one or two, you see that children's hearts are very complicated and deceitful. <laughs> if you've had your own kids, you know that. So what is the heart in scripture? Let me define it. Uh, well, first of all, the heart does lots of things. So Proverbs 14.1 says, our hearts believe. The fool says in his heart there is no God. So our beliefs come from our heart, not our minds, you'll notice, in the scriptures. Hebrews 3.7 says, our hearts harden. So our hearts believe things, our hearts harden. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So there's a temptation to our hearts becoming hard and uh, unteachable, proud. Hebrews 4.12 says our hearts have thoughts and intentions stroke desires. So the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing into to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning. The, the, so the word of God gets right into us. And what does it discern? The thoughts and the intentions or the desires of our hearts. So our hearts believe things. Our hearts can go soft and hard, you know, proud or humble teachable or unteachable and our hearts can have thoughts and our hearts can have intentions and desires or motivations i think tim put in, the, in his answer so therefore the heart in scripture is not the seat of the emotions which is what our modern culture uses the heart for in scripture the heart is not the seat of the emotions in contrast to the mind which is the seat of reason that's how today operates rather the heart is the seat of your deepest trust commitments and love from which everything flows. That's the heart. So it's not like we have a mind which is reason and a heart that's emotion. No, the heart in incorporates both the emotions and the reason, but it's much deeper. It's your trusts and it's your commitments and it's your love and everything comes out of that. So this is a dynamite quote. You may want to take a screenshot from Tim Keller. What the heart most loves and trusts, the mind finds reasonable the emotions find desirable 
and the will finds doable. Isn't that brilliant? So everything's coming out of the heart. So I always find we have this, you know, we have this whenever you do an evangelistic event and invite non-believers to come along. Everyone thinks they're being completely objective. No one's being objective because it says here what the heart most loves and trusts the mind finds reasonable. So if you, if you love and trust something that isn't Jesus, you'll find it reasonable not to believe in him. That's the way it works. The heart is dict dictating your atheism, not objective reason. Um, or you go, why are my emotions so aroused at this moment? It's just like, it's so unfair. No, we are loving and trusting something that means it's channeling our emotions in a certain way. Because other people have the same circumstances and don't have the same emotions. So it can't be what's going on around us that's driving the emotions. It's got to be our heart. And it's because we love and trust something so much. Our emotions are therefore, I mean, it could be good, by the way. It could be good emotions. I'm not going to negative necessarily. And the will finds double. Now, I am able to do this. Like Matthew talks about this now, right? If we, you know, for Hebrews 13, if we are worshipping Jesus, we will, we will want to do his will. Because our heart is in a place of worship, love it, then we can do it. But if our heart is in a place of worship, then we won't find it very doable. And that was his sermon. And it was brilliant. So really great screenshot that page and just think on that for, for a long time. That's the kind of summary of what the heart is in scripture. But there is a promise of a new heart in scripture, isn't there? So the Old Testament, the believers couldn't have this new heart. And so then Ezekiel says, I'm going to bring them back. And when in Jesus and through the spirit, we receive the benefit of this promise. If I'll take you out of the nations, I'll gather you from all countries and bring you back into your own land. I'll sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. For what's going on in the heart i'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you i'll remove your heart of stone the hard one and give you a heart of flesh i'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws so god says and again this was the song we sang that craig introduced us to christ in me he's doing it and it's this idea of what's going on in the heart the impurity and the idols the false gods are being removed as his spirit comes and gives us this soft heart uh, Jeremiah said this, the days are coming, declares the Lord, I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel. This is a covenant I'll make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. So the law of God, the will of God, the, the things God desires of us go into our hearts now. And I'll be their God and they'll be my people, this close relationship. It's not this thing on, on, on with Moses and a mediator and the tablets. It's intimate, it's inside, we know. So why is this important? Because our hearts dictate our whole lives. What is the heart? It's our deepest trust and commitments of which all our emotions and our thoughts and our actions come from. And God in scripture said he's going to give us a new heart, which we now have through Jesus by the spirit, uh, which can therefore be soft and we can be soft to God and, and to being teachable and all the rest. So for example, David, after he sins, doesn't say, Lord, help me not to find women Help me not to commit adultery. David doesn't pray that, does he? You read Psalm 51? Lord, next time, may I work harder at my eyes not being lustful. He doesn't pray that. Create in me a pure heart. If my heart changes, my eyes will never look at another woman like I shouldn't do. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken contra heart. God, you will not despise. In other words, God, what you want from me now is my heart is what I love and trust is not like lots of compensation and religious activities. And he goes on to say that that doesn't even honor you really if the heart's not in it. So David says, after I've sinned, what, what that reminds me of is my heart needs to be changed. Not I need to have more law telling me the right thing I should and shouldn't do. Again, Matthew's sermon was great. There, there, are the, there are the laws in Romans 13, but it all comes out of this place of worship, this new heart. And so that's what's key. Um, Jesus always targeted the heart. I'm not going to go to all of these, but you remember Nicodemus? You must be born again. Nicodemus is this very intellectual guy and he's got all the answers. And Jesus says, no, 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 I need to get to your heart. You can't do it yourself, Nicodemus. The spirit's got to do it. And he's like, well, how can a man be born again? And he's like, no, 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 you'll understand when you see the kingdom of God, when you're given a new heart. So he goes after Nicodemus's heart, not the mind, even though he was a bright guy. And then in the woman of the world, the famous thing, she's thirsty, not just for water, but for satisfaction in sex and men and intimacy through men and, and significance through men. That's where our heart loves and trusts. And Jesus doesn't, you know, 
initially bring up the husband and all the mess of her past. He says, I need to give you living water that will change your heart. And he does. And so again, he pushes her to say, if you're satisfied in me, if you love and trust me, you won't need to run after other men. So Jesus didn't go to her and say, hey, I've got five things to tell you about what you shouldn't do. He said, let me tell you how I can change your heart and then you won't do those things. Once you're, once you're drinking living water, you won't run after salt water anymore. You'll have the real thing. You have the religious lawyer who comes to Jesus and tries to trick Jesus and sort of say, you know, well, what's the most important thing? And Jesus says to love the Lord your God and to love you know, your neighbor as yourself. And then he tells him the good Samaritan story because he was trying to justify himself. So this is what it is to love your neighbor, love your worst enemy to the point of death. So the religious lead, lawyer wanted to come to him to try and like justify himself. It says, you know, to prove himself right. And Jesus goes, no, no, let me just rewind a bit. What's going on in the heart? And he pushes him to the lawyer says, well, I could never do that. And that's the point that you bring Mary and Martha. Mary is the one who's listening to Jesus, enjoying Jesus. Martha, the one that's busy for Jesus. Easy to be busy for Jesus. But Mary's right. She's just enjoying Jesus. And so there's one thing going on in the heart. And then Martha gets, she's angry. She's judgmental. She's all these things because she's so busy for Jesus. And Mary's so lazy. Her heart was never right. She was never doing it for Jesus. She was doing it for herself. Whereas Mary just sat there and enjoyed the words and the presence of Jesus. So Jesus is after Martha's heart. The rich young ruler. Now, we don't have time, but Luke 10, 25 and Luke 18, 18 are exactly the same. And Luke is deliberate. It says, um, so, someone comes up to Jesus, the lawyer and the rich young ruler and say, what must I do to gain eternal life? Same question. And Jesus gives different answers. And I've done lots of training of this in evangelism. In other words, you can't have one gospel answer for every person. You've got to go to the heart. So to the person, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, love your neighbor like the good Samaritan. Loved. <gasps> that's, what, that's how you, well, no one can do that, no. So you need a savior. The rich young ruler, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Give all your money away. Well, I can't do that, no. He goes after the heart. They ask the same question, they get different answers. It shows you that Jesus is after the heart. And then Peter, you know, Peter, I know everyone else might deny you, but I'm in. He can't discern his own heart, can he? He thinks he understands his heart. He thinks, I'm going to be for Jesus. And a very minute later, he can't stand up for Jesus in front of a servant girl. He, he thought he knew his heart and he didn't. And Jesus had to teach him about his heart and show him grace and show it wasn't in his strength and teach him forgiveness. And Peter then became a mighty warrior for, for Jesus. So just some examples. Jesus is always after the heart. Um, and uh, that, that's what we're doing here. All right, let me uh, mute someone to read. Rebecca Sharp and read Luke 6, 43 to 45. This is a key passage in understanding the heart. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Great. Key, key passage for understanding this idea of uh, your actions, the fruit, and where the actions come from the heart. So I'm going to put you back into your groups. You want to take a screenshot of this, guys, so you've got it uh, when you're in your breakout groups. Um, take a screenshot with your phone. How does the image of the tree help us stand the link between our hearts and our actions? How to change our actions? How circumstances reveal our hearts? Okay, you're going to answer this in breakout rooms. So take a picture, and I'm going to give you 10 minutes uh, in your breakout rooms to go over that from Luke 6. So you might want to get the Bible out uh, if, if you need that there. Luke 6, 43 to, 40, uh, to th uh, 45, not 35, excuse me. And they're the three questions. Okay, should all be self-explanatory. I'm going to put you in breakout rooms now. Okay, so what I'd like is uh, if someone from the different groups could just quickly feedback something. You don't have to go back to all the questions, just something that was maybe particularly helpful. So um, I'm going to call on uh, Mihai. Or whoever your group, if you nominated a sharer, that sharer, but Mihai's group or Mihai himself, something you learned or something you know, that uh, is helpful. I think one of the things that um, caught my attention was the last question about why our actions, um, why, how circumstances reveal our heart. 
we said that those circumstances are like pressure, like tension, uh, or the stress that makes to um, whatever is in our hearts to come out. Um, is one way to see what is in our hearts. Right. That's very helpful. We'll come back to that. Thank you, Maria. Um, could someone from Kate, of Katie, uh, Margaret, or Vanessa just share just something you learned or something that was helpful? Um, yeah, kind of going off what Maria just said there, um, number three, like how circumstances reveal our hearts. Um, I was kind of sharing that something God's really like taught me recently is how often um, when I feel like a negative emotion with like, in like a relationship or a situation or whatever, like he's really taught me to view that as almost like a grace from him um, and being able to then go back to him with that and be like, okay, Lord, I felt this way. Can you help me to see what's going on underneath this? Um, and very often then there's been like, you know, almost like subconsciously like thoughts that I've been thinking that have like caused me to like feel this way or that way that have been in my heart that I feel like if I hadn't felt the kind of emotion in the first place, I kind of wouldn't have been aware of. Um, so I find that really helpful. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. I like that, by the way. That's, we're going to come to that. What emotions have been aroused in us through in a circumstance? Just answering that question. I feel angry. I feel bitter. I feel excited. I feel jealous. Like just knowing that is key to your understanding mm -hmm. your heart. We often don't just acknowledge our feelings, and we're going to come to that. So thank you. Awesome. Someone from Daniel, Moses, Rebecca, or Tim, just to say something again briefly, just that you learn always helpful. So I think something that. Um... It was something that Dan said that really, really struck me on the metaphor of the, of like the fruit tree and that, that uh, you can, you can cultivate and work for your, the, the tree or your tree or your heart to be good. But um, if you're not feeding it with good food and with like with living water, that the tree can turn, the tree can go bad, like looking after a plant. If you don't look after it, it'll, it can, it can go bad. And that just really struck me with, with the tree, um, which is that, what am I, what am I feeding myself? What am right. I taking in on a daily basis? Because the next passage says, whatever I'm taking in, I'm going to put out into the world, whatever I store up in my heart, I'm going to put out. So that's what, that's what really struck me. That's great, isn't it? And that's why it gets to the, you know, where your roots are, what you're feeding on, what you love and trust is what you're, you're you know, is, is what the, uh, the fruit's going to be. So where mm -hmm. have you put your roots? What are you feeding on? And, and you can start to see where your roots are because you can start to see the actions and behavior in your life. So brilliant stuff. Thank you. Um, Maeve, Rebecca Sharp or Sharon, uh, one of you wants to share? Yes, uh, just similar to what you were saying, Steve, and the other girl that was speaking as well. We were just talking about um, uh, the, uh, the tree and the roots um, and... Uh, yeah um like what the other girl was saying and how the nutrients get in it, when it's good it gets into the tree and causes it to grow and the green leaves to come about and that's like an action that's happening and similar with our hearts and what what struck me about that was that it's underground it's hidden what's right. happening is hidden and the heart is a hidden place as well so um yeah very good very good and so hence why you know the classic the social media here's what i am to the world but what's really going on there's like another level of that here's what i am outside but what's really going on um is it's that's really good it's hidden uh, good okay last but not least someone from andrew tutty charles Nafi and emma marlene and edwin a bigger group math uh math made a good point that you often can't tell how good a tree's roots are until um, it's put under some pressure so maybe by a wind or whatever. So it's only in circumstances, I feel most people have kind of made that point. It's only in circumstances you really see how solid the tree is. Um, and then I kind of mentioned as well that on the surface, the tree can appear strong and healthy and good and bearing good fruit, but maybe it's actually rotten inside. You know, on first appearance, it could look good, but that's not always the case. Yeah, and eventually that'll be revealed as it, you know, we see all the time, you know, and, 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 and if, if only our lives were on the TV, like some people's, our lives would be more exposed, but someone who's got rotted inside, eventually it comes out if they're in the public light and the, the, the scrutiny of public light and, you know, God bless them, because I, I wouldn't want my life to be uh, put through that. So um, a couple of thoughts, you've, you've brought them out, guys, thank you. Circumstances are not your biggest problem, sin is. That's what that passage is saying. 
circumstances are never your biggest problem. And if you really understand the heart, that's one of the first lessons. The heart, we're being deceived every day that circumstances are our problem. The Bible says no sin and your heart is the biggest problem. Whatever the circumstance, sin is always, a, you know, because that's what is the fruit. That's where we're living from. That's the overflow. So really key. Hence why I like Katie's analytic point, which is, well, what is this circumstance just revealing about me at the moment? What emotions? Am I jealous? Am I angry? Am I happy? Am I sad? Like something is being revealed. And so what is it? Uh, circumstances reveal what's in the heart. So that's sorry, the second point there. Uh, and often, as has been well pointed out, the pressure uh, reveals it. So the, the analogy I love is, you know, if you have a, a bridge and all, your, all these cars are going over the bridge and the bridge has a hairline fracture, the cars are not revealing the fracture in the bridge and it's fine the bridge is a good bridge and then a 10 truck a 10 ton lorry drives over the bridge and the hairline fractures that were always there are now opened because of increased pressure did the lorry create the hairline fractures no it just revealed them Whereas the cars, which were applying less pressure, didn't. And that's what happens in our lives. We don't know. Our heart is deceitful. We can't see the hairline fractures. And then pressure comes and you go, oh, look how I'm reacting. Like, I didn't know that was there. And so circumstances reveal. And it's not just negative things. You know, a promotion at work, a bigger paycheck, a relationship that goes well, uh, success in sports, the positive and suddenly you find out that you're very like self-confident and arrogant and you know don't really need jesus and community and so it's not just you know there's two tests on the heart this this success and failure is a test riches and poverty is a test um you know being in the public applause and being anonymous are both tests you know so there's always a test on the heart um and it's not just not just when it's negative pressure there's positive pressure you could say and then thirdly applying rules or law to use biblical language doesn't change the heart and will not bring lasting change so if you've ever gone i'm struggling with sexual sin i'm going to do these 10 things it might get you through about two weeks month if you're going i'm always jealous of what other people look like i'm not i'm going to do these five things and i'm going to have it might get you somewhere, but it won't change the heart. So it won't deal with the issue. And lots of us go through life going, I'm saved by grace, but I'm sanctified by law. You know, I'm saved all by what Jesus does, but I then work really hard to grow as a Christian, sanctification, growing in holiness. And so what this is saying is you can't apply law because you've got to go to the roots and you've got to change what you're feeding on and where your heart is and what you love and you trust. So there, are, that lasting transformation comes through the heart. Um, I hope that's helpful uh, thoughts for you. So Paul Tripp, this book, by the way, if you really want to get into it, it was a book that just so helped me on this. I read it years ago, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. I heard him speak at my, uh, it was my first, it wasn't really a Bible college. It was one day a week theology training I was doing. And he came and I wrote about 20 pages of notes. And I came back and sat there, I was like, first, second year of marriage, I said to Leanne, I've got to go over this whole day with you. It's changed everything I know about Christian ministry and my own heart. And I just literally reread all my notes. I still have them in, in that lovely filing cabinet. Uh, I still get them out now and again. Um, and, and, and it's brilliant. Um, instruments in the Redeemer's hands. And so you see here, chapter four, the heart is the target. Chapter five, understanding the heart struggle. And off he goes. He's a biblical counselor. So he's used to counseling people for many years, but using this lens of the heart. So scripture declares that personal transformation takes place as our hearts are changed by God's grace and our minds renewed by the spirit. If my heart is the source of my sin problem, then lasting change must always travel through the pathway of my heart. It is not enough to alter my behavior or change my circumstances. Notice those, that, that, that's key. It's not enough to alter my behavior or change my circumstances. Christ transforms people by radically changing their hearts. If the heart doesn't change, the person's words and behavior may change temporarily because of external pressure or incentive. But when the pressure or incentive is removed, the change will disappear. So we've got to learn not to just, you know, apply the law, but get into that pathway of the heart and change hearts. So another way of helping you see this is a Pharisee versus a Christian. 
outward acts are the same. The actions, they both pray, they both go to church, they both give money to the poor, they both read their Bibles. Pharisees and Christians look the same, right? But motivation is completely different. One is acting to please and resemble Jesus, the Christian. The other is acting to gain control and put Jesus in their debt. Motivation, the heart is everything. But they are out actions that are the same. And then there will be the different, obviously, eventually you'll find a judgmental spirit and things. Now, we're all moving towards that Pharisee if we're not careful. We're all moving there. Every one of us has got an inner Pharisee who wants to work hard to prove themselves and, uh, and to gain some kind of control over Jesus or life or something. Okay? So Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, famously says, you can do all these great things, but if you don't have love, you gain nothing and are nothing. In other words, the heart is what matters here not whether you're doing lots of good stuff for Jesus, but whether you love Jesus. Mary Martha story. So reflections in groups on heart change. So again, take a screenshot and put you back in groups. When you want to make a change in your behavior, what do you typically do? Where have you seen applying rules not work in changing your behavior? And how does this framework help you respond to your circumstances? Share within your comfort zones. All right, welcome back, everyone. Hope that was helpful. We're not going to do feedback this time on that one because of time, but hopefully that was a helpful discussion. If we have time at the end and you've got any questions, by the way, you can ask. So we've been thinking about what the heart is in Scripture, why the heart is so important. We've been thinking about this idea of fruit and roots and how we've got to get to uh, what our motivation is and what our um, deepest loves and trust are if we're to see lasting change. And we can't just apply law. I want to give you, uh, I was writing down five examples, uh, just to give you some examples, okay? What happens if you find that you often tell a lie? Like, we all lie. You know, at some point we'll lie, right? We'll say something that's not quite true or we'll be economical with the truth or something, okay? The question we need to go is why? We know the Bible says it's wrong to lie, so why do I do it? Well, I can't, it's not just don't lie, Steve. It's, was I trying to get ahead in life? Was I trying to please people? That's the hard issue. Now I can, instead of going, don't lie, how does love of Jesus drive out, the fear of God drive out the fear of man? Or how does what Jesus has given me mean I don't need to get ahead, for example? Um, what about if I find myself looking lustfully at someone of the opposite or the same sex? Uh, and I know I shouldn't, uh, whether you're married or not, you know? Uh, what do you do? Don't look, don't look, Steve. You know, Jesus said it's like worse than murder or it's as bad as adultery. Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay, fine. That may give temporary relief and not be the worst thing short term. But for long term, I have, am I looking for control? Am I looking for pleasure? Like, why am I looking at someone? Am I looking for that sense of power that sometimes that can give us? So we, we often think lust is just a simple thing. No, there's lots of reasons why we lust. What's the deeper thing that's going on? Recognition that we don't have in life or something. And this is a little fantasy world where I'm in control. You know? So if it's control, I need to obviously trust that God's in control. If it's pleasure, I need to see him as the pleasure giver. If it's recognition, then he, you know, so I'm now at the heart issue of why I'm doing it, which will mean that if I get to that, I can replace it with Jesus in some way. And that will stop the action. What about be courageous? I'm terrible at sharing the gospel. I'm always a coward. Why am I a coward? Steve, just be stronger, be stronger. Just, just do it. Would you do it? Well, again, how do I overcome the fear of man, which is really the reason? Uh, what the consequence is going to be. What does it mean for me to be so smitten by Jesus' acceptance of me as the one that has the final word in all the universe over my life that I don't care about their word, their word over me? And that will take time, by the way. I'm not saying it's a simple thing, but now I've got to the issue of why I don't share the gospel. What about, and this is very true for me, I'm impatient and I'm unkind, particularly to the, my wife and kids, under pressure. Well, typically it's because I want to be in control. And so my plans or my expectations are not being met. And I'm not adaptable and flexible. And what's really going on is not just be more kind, be more patient, Steve, it's give up control. And when things don't go as planned or people don't respond how you expect, trust that God's in control. So for me, my nearly all of my recent sin <laughs> that I can discern comes from control, a desire to be in control. Uh, what happens is, and this is another one for me, less so recently, but I guess it was helpful. I've had a few bouts of nearly burning out. 
and I haven't, but I have had a few. And now, you know, is it just rest, Steve? Just take more rest to sleep more? Yeah, but if you've done any of my teaching on rest, it's not, you need to get deeper rest, the work beneath the work. And so I need to rest from my desire to achieve and succeed or be successful because Jesus gives me all the approval I need. I don't need approval from success. Once that has got into my heart, I'll have the rest, the deeper rest. You see? So just little examples that I quickly did to say, we've got to get beneath the action, the problem, the sin into why, what's fueling the sin. And then, you know, stop that with Jesus. Okay. So life groups, if you're in a life group, this would be helpful. If you're not, I'm encouraging you to find an accountability group. Uh, what is a life group? Well, it's a way that you pursue each other's hearts, therefore. So we're in the book of Hebrews. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart. That's a temptation that can happen for Christians that turns away from the living God. How do we do that? Well, we need other people to encourage us daily, as long as it's today. So none of us are hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So dece when you're deceived by something, you can't see it. You need someone else to help you see it but see your heart, not just the action and behavior. Why are they doing that? And we, our hearts have this tendency to be sinful and unbelieving and turn from God. Therefore, we need that encouragement coming in because we can't see it. We're deceived. Um, so that's what our life group is all about. But it's learning to ask questions so the Holy Spirit reveals what's going on in the hearts, not telling the other person what they need to hear or the answer. So that whenever I've done life groups for many years, the biggest mistake is someone shares something that's going on in their life, a sin or a challenge or a pressure or an anxiety or something, and they pour out their heart and God bless them for doing it, being vulnerable. And then, hey, well, we've all got five bits of advice for you right now. And it's like, way to kill the moment, you know? Someone had just opened up their heart and suddenly it's like, let me give you all my advice on what you should do with that. So a life group and learning, or, or even just in any kind of pastoral or discipleship, or even just friendship, learning to ask questions and trust the Holy Spirit's going to do the changing so they can understand their hearts, not just telling people. It, there is a course a moment to tell people stuff, but that's just a really helpful thing. So four layers of the heart we're going to think about, and then I'm going to get you practicing. The first aspect of the heart we've looked at today, haven't we? You know, the fool says in his heart that we have thoughts. Okay, so what am I thinking about the situation? So let's take COVID-19. What are my thoughts about COVID-19? Any thoughts? And then what are my feelings? Bottom of the slide there, bottom left. Like, how am I feeling in response? So that was uh, Katie's point. Like, what's being aroused in my feelings? And then my desires. And we'll talk about surface and deep desires. Like, what's really going on in the heart? That's where your desires is right where your, where your heart is, what you desire, your motivation. So what do I desire in this moment? Um, you know, simple example, do I desire just the circumstance to change or for God to change me in the circumstance? You know, it's just a little thing, but it's a good example. What am I actually doing? It can be both. It can be both, by the way. And then choices. What choices do I make? So the heart thinks, the heart feels, the heart desires, and the heart chooses. So as we're thinking about our own hearts and our friends' hearts, what, hey, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you desiring? And what are you going to choose? Four questions. Um, so what do you believe about this issue? What are you thinking about it? Just ask those two questions. I'm going to get you practicing this in a minute. Feelings. What are you feeling about this? Sheesh? What emotions have been touched in you because of this or aroused in you? Desires. What do you want in this situation? What are your desires at this moment? And by the way, we mustn't answer with the right answers. That's okay to be in the wrong place, if you know what I mean. Like, that's the point of this. I'm just trying to get to where I'm at now so I can get to maybe where God wants me to be. But, you know, if my desire in this situation is I just want to end all the stress, I just want to have my money back, I, you know, whatever it is, that's okay. And that's not even necessarily wrong. So it's just being honest about where our hearts are so we can think about what God might be doing in our hearts. And then given my thoughts, feelings, and desires, what choices, what choice can you take? Or what choice shouldn't you take? You know, you can, you can go there. So that's the four layers of the heart. We're going to practice this. In one sense, it does go a bit like that. It's, it's not a science. It, a conversation with someone goes here, there, and everywhere. But for the sake of this exercise, I want you to go through the four steps. Literally, what are your thoughts around this? What are your feelings? Maybe a second question on each of those. What are your desires? Tell us more about those desires. How long do you have those desires? Those kind of things. What are your choices? What, what, what choices could you make now? What choices sh shouldn't you make or whatever? Um, 
in the uh, in the in the on the web page, I I I, uh, I link to this uh, pursuing the heart workshop, which some of this is coming from. And there's just tons, by the way, if you want to read up of great open-ended questions you can ask. You know, so tell me more about that. You've told me three issues, which is the most important right now. Um, can you name some of the feelings that surface in you as we talk about this? You know, so there's some really good questions if you're wanting good questions. It's on uh, page 11 of, 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 the, of the workshop. Huh? Now, on the feelings bit, if you're anything like me, sometimes you're not great at articulating your feelings. And one of the good things this thing has done, this uh, workshop has given us, and again, I, I can't remember what page on it it is, but you can find it afterwards, is it's given us a chart of pleasant and unpleasant emotions. And it's not the ones right or wrong, it's just trying to understand the hearts. So it's page four of that, of that, uh, of that work, of, 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 the, uh, of the workshop. So I often struggle to articulate what I'm feeling because I'm often not feeling anxious for example, on a negative side. And that's often what people say when they're going, I feel anxious. I don't typically get anxious. Or um, I may not feel like, you know, super excited or happy, but I might feel um, interested, for example, or uh, peaceful or powerful or jubilant or something or safe. So having this is actually helpful when you're having a conversation to say, actually, where, what do I feel right now? I'm not very good at expressing it. Um, and so on the unpleasant side, for example, this really helped me with my tendency for control, I felt uncertain. As in, and I've never used that feeling before. How do I feel? I feel uncertain, because I, it just, I, something's out of my control. Or I felt disappointed. Uh, or I felt annoyed. I, I realized how often I felt annoyed at things. So for me, it wasn't, you know, I felt angry. I didn't, I might have felt irritated or bitter. I didn't feel bitter. I didn't feel depressed. I felt other things and it's not there's right and wrong. It's not, it's just trying to understand the heart. So I found those two grids super helpful when I'm trying to understand my heart or help someone understand this. All right. I, uh, time is running out, but we've then got to look. So we've talked about thoughts, talked about feelings. Now what about desires? The surface desires, you know, I want money, a car, a house, a ring, clothes, toys. I want an ex vacation, a climb a mountain, walk in the woods, I want romance sport, or I want a position like to be a mother, a father, a husband, a wife, a particular job. I want something relational, a family, a you know, these are surface desires and they're meaningful and important. But underneath the surface desires are much deeper desires that really help us unlock our hearts. So the purpose to be part of something bigger, a relationship to value, to pursue or be pursued to be in community or family, impact, significance, honor, respect, valued, understood, virtuous, to protect and provide or to be protected and provided for, security, to come through, duty, honor, to hear well done, uh, some kind of transcendence through beauty and creativity, justice and truth and freedom. You know, these are deeper things that we've got to sort of go, okay, this is definitely what's at the surface, but why is that at the surface? Because there's something deeper in my heart. And again, God provides those things. God in his church. So um, we haven't got time to do all this now, but that's helpful for you just to realize what's at the surface and what's um, a bit deeper uh, down. Um, uh, uh, Vanessa's put it in there. And the name of the book, uh, this is a question, thank you for the question, is Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. Um, and uh, it's that, yeah, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands by Paul Tripp. Um, thank you, Vanessa, for putting those in there. So, um this is another seminar once we've understood our hearts how do we apply the gospel to our hearts and i try to do it there a little bit with just my version of what's really going on and how does jesus supply that so what do i already have in jesus that i'm seeking elsewhere what does it mean for me to believe in think about the heart enjoy so you know beliefs feelings desires and you know, what does it mean for to believe in to enjoy desire and choose jesus right now and what passages in the Bible speak directly to my thoughts, feelings, desires, and choices. So there's a whole other seminar on applying the gospel to the heart, which we can do if you're interested in. So I want you to go, I'm going to put you back in your groups. I want you to nominate a questioner and a answerer. And then I'm going to get you to flip. And if you've got four people, you can rotate it. Use COVID-19 and maybe something specific to you in COVID-19, you know, a job loss or a separation from family or the, the boredom. Just like pick something or something good, you know, the rest and the, and the relaxation. Share within your comfort zone. But I want one of you to just walk through those four steps and listen carefully and ask another question back. And then um, 
I use those secondary questions and then I want you to flip just to learn the exercise, okay? So back into your groups, you're gonna have to organize yourselves quickly because I want you back in again. Hope that was helpful and uh, I know we'd, we'd have more time and I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish it at 7.30 and then have time for questions if you wanna stick around for a bit longer. So in the chat pane, uh, what have you learned today? Or if you wanna ask a question as well or both, you can. So just be good for everyone to share in the chat pane what they've learned and then we'll pray to finish. Uh, but I will stick around if you want to ask questions or chew over anything. So in the chat pane, what have you learned today? Question, so should you still do the right thing even if your heart isn't in it? Yeah, that's very good. Um, and I guess the, uh, there's a question there, Katie, are you talking about yourself or someone else? Uh, but let's say you're talking about yourself. Yeah, I think you should, but that's the short term thing that I'm talking about. If you never get beyond that, in the end, it won't last. So absolutely right now, um, you know, at times, you know, I remember this, you know, classic sort of parenting example. It's four in the morning and my kid wants a cuddle and whatever. And I, I don't feel like I want to, but I'm just going to get myself, grit my teeth to love my kid. But if, if I, I've also got to learn to just find a deep love for my child, which means I'm sort of glad to as well at a bigger level. Um, so yeah, I think you should, I think you should, but you, you've got, you've really got to work hard on your heart to go, why am I only doing this for, because it should, uh, that's what I would say there. Surface desires and deep desires beyond, going beyond the surface. Great. What are other people's, um, takeaways from today? Everyone in the chat pane, uh, Katie, come back to me or unmute yourself if you want to, off your question. Concerning my actions, not to blame circumstances, my heart. Yeah. Just in the, one of the breakout rooms, I was listening to a testimony from Mez McConnell, who's uh, in certain circles a well-known Christian leader. And he was a drug addict and he was left abandoned at two years old and was in 30 or 40 institutions growing up. And he eventually, and he was in prison, a high security prison in the UK, severe drug addict and dealer. And he was confronted by Christians, uh, shared the gospel with them, and he reacted so negatively against them that he was, you know, he was to blame for his sin not his circumstances and upbringing. And, uh, and they used to spit on one of the Christian leaders, but that Christian leader eventually did what Matthew said today in the talk, took him into the home and he found a home that he loved and he got converted. And he basically said, the thing I had to realize is I couldn't blame my circumstances for my problems. I had to blame my sin. There's a guy that was thrown on the streets at two years old. And he, he ended up realizing the only way out of this is to realize I'm a sinner needing saving. And, uh, and so that was interesting. I just watched that. Okay. Uh, Daniel, learn today. I had many ideas and concepts about this topic today has helped me put them together and also think on practical things to do when I have doubts in my own heart. Okay, good. Need to read instruments in, in the Redeemer's hands. Seek to further understand the heart by reading more good. We cannot change our actions by sheer willpower. Absolutely. I learned there are a few things on the surface. I did not know the problem is in the heart. Very good. Uh, a simple but helpful question is why am I doing this? Yeah. A very uh, a good need for more study. Good. Anything else other than the learning? So any other questions um, before we uh, finish today? A few more, Rebecca. That we re that's reaching out to God to close Christian friends for help. It's not a failure. I couldn't do it all alone, so it feels like a failure. Yeah, exactly. And there we've got to another issue of right of control and and stuff. So very good, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca Shop. I need to be patient. Sometimes change in the heart takes time. Oh, Amen, sister need to constantly um being good going to god asking him to come out yeah it does take time it does take time yeah uh is it possible to notice when our heart is in is is on tune with my is it possible to notice when our heart is on tune with my desires can we do a follow-up so yeah i'm happy to do one on how to apply the gospel to your heart yeah we can do that i'll do that matthew what was your point you can answer it yeah, Steve, um, I think going through the, the questions and doing a one-to-one -one with somebody, so there's four of us and, and me and, me and Toddy did it, but when it comes to asking the questions, we, we need to be very clear at listening to what people are saying so right. that we're able to, one, address what they're saying and then two, to try and form uh, a good question because I suppose going, going to the heart isn't just those four questions we, we need to try and articulate it in such a way that it's not robotic and so yeah. i'm wondering if you have any helpful tips on on what it is to, to listen well and then to to begin to move through this process 
Well, well let, let's do another uh, seminar because, yeah, there's a whole little exercise which is called the HEAR exercise. So, so yeah, we need to, and the, the, the four steps are, you know, ask the Holy Spirit, engage the whole heart, ask powerful and open questions and respond. So there's a sense in which as you say something, I really listen so then I can ask another question or, you know, guide the questioning in a certain way or stop and pray or whatever. So, yeah, we must, it's not a formula. It's not a formula. It's a, it's a real person-to-person -person interaction. Very good um yeah it's easy to identify what is on the heart just listening and so uh, it's not easy yeah i agree it takes time to discern your own heart um and i think i just really agree with rebecca's point that our hearts don't change overnight um and uh, we need to continually be seeking god and for those that talked about the need to be vulnerable that's key and it's not, you're not a failure when you need help you're actually starting to enter into christian maturity you know and community so uh, good. Okay, uh, we'll look out for seminar number three then, how to apply the gospel to your heart. And thanks everyone for coming.